a species. Now remember when we talked about microevolution and macro? Microevolution is on a small time scale, whereas macroevolution encompasses major biological changes over a long period of time. And in macroevolution, you'll start to see the formation of new species. Now, speciation is the term for the formation of a new species. And this is the focal point of macroevolution. And we're gonna talk about in a minute the two different ways, the two paces that speciation typically takes on. But we need to start first by talking about what is a species. If you remember back to our lecture in lab on diversity of life, we wrote down a definition of a species. And the biological species concept defines a species as a group of populations whose members have the potential to interbreed with one another and to produce fertile offspring. Okay, so if two organisms reproduce and produce fertile offspring, that would be of the same species. If they are reproductively isolated, meaning they can't reproduce with one another, then they are two separate species. Okay, and so we'll talk about how does speciation occur. Now, when we look at the biological species concept, it's important to note that this is based on reproductive compatibility rather than physical similarity. If you look here at these two birds, you'll notice that they look very similar. But in fact, those two birds are two different species. If you look at humans, on the other hand, humans are all of one species, right? We're all homo sapiens, yet we see so much genetic diversity within our population. And so that's a really big, important fact to think about is you can't just look at an organism to say whether or not they are of the same species. Two organisms can look very similar, like the example here on the left, but in fact not be able to breed and therefore would not be of the same species. And so we'll spend some time talking about what are these reproductive barriers that can occur that, a, that make it so two organisms cannot interbreed. So because biological species are defined in terms of the reproductive compatibility, the formation of a new species depends on reproductive isolation, meaning that they are reproductively isolated and they can't breed with one another. And so a reproductive barrier is anything that prevents individuals of closely related species from interbreeding. And we're gonna look at some of these reproductive barriers. What are these reasons that prevent two closely related organisms from breeding together? And so we're gonna look at how do new species arise. So when we talk about patterns of evolution, there are two main types. Uh, one is referred to as non-branching evolution, meaning that a particular species just changes. So if you look here, here's our original population, and they have evolved some new traits. So example, notice the coloring is a little bit different. And if that new coloring makes that organism uh, more likely to survive and reproduce and pass it on with a greater frequency, then that species has now evolved, but they haven't formed a new species. On the other hand, when we look at branching evolution, this is where some of the members of that population acquire um, a new allele. And once they do that, if that prevents those two organisms from breeding, now we have a new species formed, right? We still have the original bird, but we now also have this other new species um, that cannot breed with the original. And so that is speciation. They can no longer breed. So we're gonna talk about some reproductive isolations and some barriers for reproduction. And the reproductive barriers can be broken up into two main categories. Uh, the first are the pre-zygotic barriers. And pre is before, 
and zygotic means the zygote. So if you remember back to when we talked about a zygote, that's that early embryo, that fertilized egg. And so these type of barriers actually exist before the zygote is ever formed. So for one reason or another, it may prevent members from different species from even attempting to mate. It could also prevent an attempted mating from being completed successfully. Or it may hinder fertilization if mating is completed successfully. So maybe they can reproduce or mate, but you can't actually um, form offspring. And so these would be some examples of prezygotic barriers. And we'll talk about specific types for each one of these. Postzygotic, right? Post is after. Zygote is the zygote. So these are ones that exist after the zygotes formed. So in this type of isolation, the zygote's able to form, but for one reason or not, um, once the zygote forms, it can't um, continue to be uh, to populate a new species, okay? And so this contributes to reproductive isolation after the zygotes form. And we're gonna talk about the three types. So reduced hybrid viability, reduced hybrid fertility, and reduced hybrid breakdown. Okay, and so we're gonna start by focusing on the prezygotic barriers first. And again, this is before the zygote happens. So this is where you actually can um, have prezygotic barriers that isolate two organisms reproductively through one of three ways. Um, temporal isolation is time. So maybe they made at different times of the year. Maybe one is a nocturnal organism and one is out during the day. So temporal refers to time. Habitat isolation, if you talk about an organism's habitat, it's like where does it live? So if two organisms have different habitats, if one lives on land and one lives in water, they're gonna be physically isolated from one another and therefore they're not gonna be able to breed. And then we also have behavioral isolation. And so this is where the behavior of the organisms are not compatible. Uh, maybe it's a bird that sings a slightly different song that can't be used in a mating ritual. Okay, and so that's behavioral isolation. When looking at after a mating attempt, so meaning two organisms can attempt to mate, there are other reasons that a zygote might not form. Uh, one would be mechanical isolation. So maybe they can't physically get their genitalias to line up. Um, also, we might have gametic isolation, meaning that the gametes can't form. Um, the two gametes actually can't come together through fertilization. And so let's look at some specific examples. So let's look at the different types of prezygotic barriers. And the first prezygotic barrier is going to be our habitat isolation. And again, the habitat is the environment environment in which an organism lives. And so when we talk about habitat isolation, it means that they live in two different environments. Um, again, maybe one lives in water and one lives on land. Those would be unique habitats that don't overlap. In this example here, these ladybugs feed on different plants. And because they feed on different plants and they live in these different environments, they are reproductively isolated and they're not gonna be able to breed and they're not gonna produce fertile offspring. If we look at temporal isolation, this, remember, temporal refers to time. And so these are reproductively isolated based on time. Now, it could be the times in which they're active. Maybe one is a nocturnal organism and one is active during the day. If that's true, they're not gonna be able to reproduce with one another because they're not active at the same times. Um, another way that there could be temporal isolation is that maybe they're fertile at different times. Maybe one is fertile, let's say, in the spring, and another species is fertile during the fall. And if they're fertile during different times of the year and that those fertilities don't overlap, 
then those two organisms are going to be reproductively isolated and they're not going to be able to mate with one another. In terms of behavioral isolation, again behavioral meaning like behavior, and an example of this would be possibly different courtship activities. Uh, frogs, each species of frogs, might have their own unique mating call. And the mating call from one species might not attract the female from another species. And so this is a behavioral isolation. Their behavior is actually isolating them from reproducing with one another. Then we have our mechanical isolation. And this is where the mating uh, organs might be incompatible. So if you look down here and you look at these two species of snails, when they try to reproduce, they may try to reproduce, but their mating organs might not line up properly. And because their mating organs can't line up, they're not able to successfully reproduce. And so this would be a reproductive barrier. Similarly, you might also have incompatible pollinators. So if you look at sage species, sage species use different pollinators. And because of this, they're gonna be reproductively isolated because the different pollinator is, gonna, is not gonna land on the other type of plant. And then lastly, we have our gametic isolation. And this is where the gametes cannot unite, meaning fertilization cannot occur. And you can imagine that in animals that reproduce, let's say, in water, um, think of animals that release egg and sperm into the water. There are many different species that release egg and sperm into the water. And you wouldn't want, let's say, sea stars being fertilized by sea urchin sperm, right? And so because of this, and you want that species specificity, that is going to basically prohibit different species from being able to reproduce. Um, if you compare, let's say, a red sea urchin versus a purple one, uh, their egg and sperm are not compatible, and therefore they can't have fertilization occur. Another big reason that you can sometimes have gametic isolation might be due to differences in chromosome number. So if you think about it, we've talked about, you know, for humans, human eggs have 46, or human eggs have 23 chromosomes, the sperm have 23 chromosomes. When fertilization occurs, we restore the diploid number. However, if there are abnormalities in chromosomes, let's say between two different species, uh, because of this, when fertilization goes to occur, it's not gonna occur properly because uh, they have different chromosome numbers. Uh, but mostly when we're talking about gametic isolation, there actually is a signal on the sperm that allows it to recognize a specific species of eggs. Now, for our post-zygotic barriers, remember these are the ones after the zygote forms. So in this case, fertilization can occur and the zygote forms, but there's a problem after that fertilization. And so this could include reduced hybrid viability, reduced hybrid fertility, and hybrid breakdown. And these three types of barriers prevent having viable fertile offspring. And remember that a species is defined as the ability to reproduce and produce fertile offspring. And so these prevent uh, forming viable fertile offspring. So examples of post-zygotic uh, reproductive isolation. The first is hybrid inviability. And so in hybrid inviability, the hybrid offspring fail to reach maturity. For example, hybrid eucalyptus seeds and seedlings are not viable. They're not able to mature and turn into a new organism. And so that's hybrid inviability. The hybrids are not uh, viable. We also get hybrid infertility. And this is where the hybrid offspring are unable to reproduce. So again, we've talked about you know a horse and a donkey. They can reproduce together and they can form a mule, but a mule is not a species because, because it's infertile. 
There are many hybrids that demonstrate hybrid infertility. There are such a thing as ligers. Okay, so if you cross a lion and a tiger, you get a liger. But these ligers are infertile. And so a liger is not a species. It's a hybrid, but it can't go on to produce a fertile offspring. And so that's why we would say a lion is one species and a tiger is another. The next one is hybrid breakdown. And this is where the second generation hybrids have reduced fitness. So meaning that the hybrids are able to reproduce, but their offspring are not viable. Um, offspring of hybrid mosquitoes, for example, have abnormal genitalia and they can't reproduce properly. And so these are all examples of post-zygotic barriers. So question for you, a species of grasshopper will only mate with male A after hearing a highly specific song pattern. She will not mate with male B because he doesn't make this song. Has speciation occurred between males A and B? And if yes, which reproductive barrier is, is operating? Red, no, speciation has not occurred. Yellow, yes, behavioral isolation. Green, yes, mechanical isolation. Blue, yes, gametic isolation. So pause, think about your answer, and when you're ready, push play again. So if you said yellow, you are correct. Yes, speciation has occurred because male A and male B can't, um, the, those types of organisms can't reproduce with one another. So yes, speciation has occurred because they're reproductively isolated and it's behavioral isolation because of the song pattern. So they use a slightly different uh, mating ritual, which is a type of a behavior. And so yes, it's a behavioral isolation. So here's another one. Two squirrel populations are separated on two sides of a canyon for 10,000 years as a result of migration. Upon reuniting, they mate and produce fertile offspring. Has speciation occurred between these two populations? If yes, which reproductive barrier is operating? So go ahead and pause, think about your answer, and when you're ready, push play. So if you said red, no speciation has not occurred, you would be correct. Remember that if those organisms can reproduce and produce fertile offspring, then they are the same species. And so because these two organisms can still reproduce, they're no longer separate. They're, they're not separate species. They're of the same species. And so speciation has not occurred. We have not formed a new species. So when we talk about the mechanisms for speciation, these reproductive barriers arise in two ways depending on spatial patterns. Allopatric speciation is where the, you don't get contact between the two populations. And so because of their reproductive isolation, they have acquired changes that allow them to no longer breed with one another. Sympatric speciation means that they're still they're in the same geographical area. They're not geographically isolated, yet there's some reason that they have formed two new species. And we'll talk about some examples of both types. So again, allopatric speciation is where a physical barrier separates the two populations. And that physical separation um, has mutations and changes occurring in the populations, those two populations that don't interbreed. And when you get no gene transfer between the two populations, each proceeds down its own evolutionary line. Each faces its own selective pressures in its environment 
and therefore different adaptations might arise in those new populations. And when they come back together, they may have acquired new mutations that made them no longer able to reproduce. And so this may then give rise to one or more reproductive barriers. It could be, again, uh, it could be a behavioral isolation. So maybe the mating calls different. It could be a gametic change. There are lots of different types of reproductive barriers that could form because two species are geographically separated. For example, we talked about Darwin. Remember when Darwin went on his journey to the Galapagos Islands, one of the things that kind of made him think about natural selection was that when he looked at the organisms on the Galapagos Islands and compared those to the ones that were on South America, he noticed that they were similar, they had some similarities, yet they also had differences as well. And that's because when those species were reproductively isolated when they were in their own environments they faced their own selective pressures and when that happened they evolved independently and they formed new species species that if they came back together would not be able to reduce would not be able to reproduce and produce fertile offspring and so this just shows Okay, so if two species get geographically separated, but they can come back together and the populations can still interbreed, then we would say no speciation has occurred, right? If they still have the ability to breed, you haven't formed a new species. However, if you get reproductive or if you get spatial isolation, so some geographic barrier, for example, and if now those two populations, which are separated, if they have changed enough that they, when they come back together, they cannot uh, breed with one another, then speciation has occurred. They have now formed two independent species. They're no longer um, of the same species. They're reproductively isolated. In sympatric speciations, populations diverge genetically while sharing the same habitat. Uh, there are fish that have diversified into several species in a small African lake. Each species of these fish specializes in its unique microenvironment, and this leads to reproductive isolation and therefore speciation. So maybe one lives where there's more oxygen present and another species lives in an area where there's less oxygen available. And so because of this, even though they're in the same habitat, they might still be reproductively isolated and therefore have evolved to be their own independent species. And so that's sympatric speciation. It's speciation that forms even while sharing the same habitat. And so this is just showing you the two mechanisms of speciation. So again, allopatric speciation, where they're geographically isolated. So it might be, you know, um, a mountain that formed. It could be a volcano that erupted. It could be due to migration. But allopatric just basically means that they're in two separate environments, and because of this, they each face their own selective pressures and they acquire changes that makes them reproductively isolated so that when they come back, they can no longer breed. In sympatric speciation, there's no physical separation. So they're not geographically isolated. They actually might share the same habitat, yet there are still differences between them so that they are now also reproductively isolated and can no longer breed with one another. And now we have two new species. So both of these methods both form a new species, but one is physically separated through geography and the other is that they're in the same region, but they still become different enough to be reproductively isolated. <laughs>
So now we'll talk about what is the tempo of speciation? Like how does this occur? Is it something that happens very quickly or is it something that takes a long period of time uh, to form a new species? And the answer is, is that there are two contrasting models of the pace of speciation. Um, the gradual model basically means that you get uh, big changes or speciation occur by steady accumulation of many small changes. So over time, the organisms each acquire small changes and eventually they get enough changes so that two new species is formed. On the other hand, there's also what's referred to as the punctuated equilibrium model. And this means that there is there are long periods of little change or equilibrium punctuated by abrupt episodes of speciation. So you might have a quick round of speciation, meaning it happens very quickly, and there are enough changes so that they have now formed two new species. And then you have long periods of time with no changes. And then maybe you get some more changes and you get some new species that way. And so these are the two contrasting uh, modes for the pace of evolution. Now, evolution often can occur uh, quickly following a mass extinction. And so if you think about the dinosaurs, the end of the dinosaurs, when the dinosaurs became extinct, we started to see a big expansion of the types of mammals that formed after that period. And so evolution can occur very quickly um, following a mass extinction. And the surviving organisms exploit new resources in that new changed environment. And we're gonna talk about that the early mammals were in fact small insect eating mammals. Once the dinosaurs went extinct, those mammals were no longer nocturnal, meaning that they were only active when the dinosaurs were not, but now they could be active during the day. And we started to see this big expansion in the types of mammals that um, followed that mass extinction. And so the last part of this lecture is gonna look at how do we categorize Earth's living things? How do we classify organisms as one type or another? So when we classify organisms, we use what's called taxonomy. And taxonomy is the branch of biology concerned with naming and classifying species and grouping organisms according to a more formal scheme. And the scheme can fit, consists of different levels of classification, each more comprehensive than those below it, right? The most, most narrowed down form of classification, remember, is the species because a species is very specific. The members of a species have to be able to breed and produce fertile offspring. And remember that as we go up from there, we get more broad. And again, we'll look at another example of this. But in science, when we go to name Earth species, we use a two name or a binomial nomenclature. The first name is gonna be the genus. So for humans, our genus is gonna be Homo, and remember we capitalize the Homo. Our species is gonna be Sapiens, and our species is gonna be lowercase, and we underline the two names separately. And so the second is gonna be the species, and the first is gonna be the genus. So remember when we talked about in lab classifying living things, the easy way to remember the classification scheme, remember do, keep, pots, clean, or family gets sick. The D, which is the most broad classification, again is the domain. And we talked about that currently we use a three domain system. Uh, we have bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Bacteria and archaea are made of prokaryotic cells. Domain eukarya has eukaryotic cells. And then we start to get more specific. So the next set of classification would be the kingdom. And so remember that if we're looking in domain eukarya, those are all the eukaryotic organisms. So the fungus, um, the animals, the plants, 
uh, the protus. Those are all types of eukarya. But when we get to kingdom, we get a lot more specific. And so for the kingdom, now we may have the animalia. And so these are going to be your animals. So we have our fish, our worm, our bear, our cat members, um, a butterfly, and um, our mouse. Then we get more specific and we come to the phylum. And in the phylum for this example, the phylum is chordata, the chordates, the ones that have the remnants of a backbone. So what's called a notochord. So the worm is out and the butterfly's out, but we still have the fish, the bear, the, the cat family, and the mouse. We get more specific classification. We get our class and our class is going to be mammalia or our mammals. And these are where the females have mammary glands to feed their young. And so notice the fish is out. We get more specific order. And in this case, order carnivora. These are the carnivores. So the mouse is out. Then we get to family. And in this case, we're looking at family as felidae or the feline family. Notice these are the cat family, the bears out. Genus, we start to get more specific. Okay, so felis. Now we're getting the lion out. Then we get to species, and this is the most specific. And so notice now we have our species, felis, which is the genus name, domestica, which is the species. And so this is a cat that can breed with more of its own kind and produce fertile offspring. It would not be able to breed with this other member that's now excluded from its species. So question for you, which species of animals are probably most closely related evolutionarily? Red, animals in the same genus. Yellow, animals in the same order. Green, animals in the same family blue, animals in the same phylum, or purple, animals in the same class. So go ahead and pause, think about your answer. If you said red, animals in the same genus, you are correct. Because remember that the, the lower the level of classification, so like a species, for example, are very closely related evolutionarily. They're very similar, which is why they're able to reproduce. When you get to more broad classification, like domain, for example, organisms in the same domain are very distantly related to one another, right? They diverged a long time ago, which is why they're very separated in terms of their taxonomy. And so the answer would then be red animals in the same genus because genus is the next level up from species and so organisms in the same genus are going to be very very similar and they're going to be the most closely related evolutionarily if species was a choice on this list then you would have chosen species but out of these choices the most closely related would be the genus So the biological discipline of systematics is concerned with establishing degrees of relatedness among both living and extinct species. Systematics establishes evolutionary family trees, or what we call phylogenies, by reviewing various kinds of evidence, including radiometric dating, so remember um, a way to basically uh, figure out the age of a fossil, the fossil record, and also DNA sequence comparison. And so based on this evidence, they can then determine the evolutionary relationships among species. Now, this group of biology is constantly changing and it's being reworked all the time as we get more and more information. So here's an example of a phylogenetic tree and this is going to depict evolutionary relationships based on the descent from a common ancestor. And so notice here, birds and dinosaurs are very closely related. They have diverged from one another more recently. They have a common ancestor, so each of these little nodes 
indicates a common ancestor. And so if you're looking in terms of time, if you go back further in time, they have a common ancestor with the crocodiles. And then those branch here from the lizards and the snakes. Here are the turtles, the mammals, and the amphibians. And so notice that the amphibians are the least related from the birds. They diverged the farthest back in the history of time, whereas birds and dinosaurs are very closely related, right? They diverged into separate species more recently. So Linnaeus was a scientist who divided all known forms of life originally between the plant and animal kingdoms. And this prevailed with this two kingdom system for over 200 years. In the mid 1900s, that two kingdom system was replaced by a five kingdom system. One that put all the prokaryotes in one kingdom, they called it Monera, and it divided the eukaryotes among the four other kingdoms. And then they quickly realized that that form of classification wouldn't work as well. And that in fact, we needed to have domains which were even more broad and the prokaryotes were divided into two domains and the eukaryotes were all put in a, its own domain. So if you look at the three domain classification system, here we have this early common ancestor and notice that this common ancestor diverged into what gave rise to the bacteria and the common ancestor that gave rise to the archaea and the eukarya. And again, remember, even though organisms in the domain archaea are made of prokaryotic cells, just like the bacteria are, notice that if you look at this phylogenetic tree, archaea have more in common with organisms in the domain eukarya than they do with bacteria. And so this evolutionary tree shows that um, type of depiction. And when you look in the domain eukarya, again, it classically was divided into four kingdoms, but again, now the protists are being divided up into multiple kingdoms. So looking at the phylogenetic tree, which two animals are the most closely related? Is it the kangaroo and the beaver, the beaver and the iguana, the duck-billed platypus and the iguana, or the kangaroo and the duck-billed platypus? So again, think about your answer, pause, and when you're ready, push play again. Okay, if you said red, the kangaroo and the beaver, you are correct. Notice that they branched the most recently of all of these other groups. And if you look at this particular type of uh, phylogenetic tree, notice that they even have the traits that they use to divide these. So for example, organisms on this side of the phylogenetic tree, the reason they were separated from the iguana was because these organisms had hair and mammary glands. This one does not. Gestation is going to separate the duckbill platypus from the kangaroo and the beaver. And then the length of the gestation would separate the beaver and the kangaroo. But notice because those branched the most recently, those are the most closely related. Question two says, what is the common ancestor of the kangaroo and the duckbill platypus? Is it A, B, or C. Again, pause, and when you're ready, turn it back on. If you said B, you're correct. So notice that if you look here, here's the duck-billed platypus, here's the kangaroo. And at that node, that's the last common ancestor. So the common ancestor between the kangaroo and the duck-billed platypus would be B.